This is Thursday, January 19, 2017. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan, and we are privileged to have with us today Kenneth Pitts. Welcome, Ken. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? 17 October 1968. And where were you born? Fort Irwin, California. And where is Fort Irwin? It is in the middle of the Mojave Desert, about 25 miles away from Death Valley. And what community do you currently live in? I live in Natick. And your marital status? Divorced. And do you have children? Two kids, 15 and 11. Okay, and now, uh, what was it like growing up? So, um, I was an Army brat. My father, I was born in Fort Irwin. My father left 10 weeks after that to, for Vietnam. And I went back to Texas with my mother and when he returned from Vietnam a year later, we spent a lot of time moving, so every three years we'd pick up and move. Um, mm -hmm. And your father, I understand, was an officer? Yes. And what specialty was he? He was an armor officer, so armor cavalry. Did he ever talk about his Vietnam experiences? Occasionally, yes. You know. okay. And you're an army brat, so tell us some of the places you got to live. Um, well, uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky, uh, Arkansas, uh, Panama um, from 79 82, Germany, which was 74 or sometime mm -hmm. around there. We were there for three years. Um, that's pretty much uh, in a, mm -hmm. Fort Devens, Massachusetts. Okay. Yeah. And you were growing up during the height and then kind of the tail end of the Vietnam War and mm -hmm. with the Cold War still going on. What was that like? Um, well, it, it was interesting in the sense that, uh, like, for instance, we lived in Germany in the, in the middle of the Cold War, and uh, my father's got some interesting, funny tales about that, but um, I, I was really insulated from a lot of that, and certainly the discontent with the Vietnam era and the low points of the Army in the, in the 70s uh, it was, um, I only heard about it as an adult. I really didn't, sheltered from it, I guess. Mm -hmm. And what was your schooling like? Uh, actually went to very good schools. Department of Defense had mm -hmm. really good school system. Um, occasionally, like in Arkansas, I would go to uh, regular public schools and mm -hmm. um, there was definitely a difference. And I think that the Department of Defense schools tend to be pretty good. Um, it was hard, I think, picking up and leaving here for three years, particularly around the age 11. Cause that's when you start to really form close friendships. And, um, but. Um, but all in all, in the balance, I thought it was a very interesting way to live and, mm -hmm. and it made me, I think, flexible in some ways. Uh, what, uh, did you go to high school or its equivalent? Sure. Um, so I went to ninth grade in Ayer, mm -hmm. Massachusetts. I uh, was only there um, for a year and then went to, uh, we moved into New Hampshire. My father continued to work out of Fort Devens and I finished up my high school in a uh, town in southern New Hampshire. And what happened after high school? Well, um, so I intended to go to college. Uh, my parents divorced uh, right after my senior year, so right after I graduated. Uh, so things were kind of up in the air. I spent a year working in a foundry, uh, waited on some tables, and I took a college course. And, and after working out the finances of going to school, I figured, uh, why not join the Army? Uh, they have the GI Bill. Uh, there's been nothing but peace since Vietnam with the little thing in Grenada in 83. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the Berlin Wall was coming down, it was, the flowers were growing up between the cracks, and uh, I figured it would be a good time to join. And where and when did you join? I, uh, I swore in at the MEP station in Manchester, New Hampshire, and that was in uh, April or March. March of, actually, I signed the papers in March of uh, 89 and then shipped out in April. That is an interesting time because it, it, you just said it, mm. that the Berlin Wall had just fallen. Right, right. Um, but things were going to change. Mm -hmm. So, and where were you sent for basic training? Fort Benning, Georgia. And what did your daddy tell you about basic? Um, it's hard to remember, but uh, he was an officer. I, yeah. I enlisted, so mm -hmm. our trajectories would be different. Um, 
uh, in, in you know, there, between the armor and the infantry, there's probably some um, you know, good natured derision. So I think that um, he just said it would be hard, but nothing that I couldn't handle. And it was true. It wasn't that bad. Did you uh, have any uh, special in, in mind? Um, in a, any specialty in mind? Sure. Um, I enlisted. Uh, I was very specific about what I wanted or wanted to get out of the enlistment. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do something different, and um, uh, I was a bit of an adrenaline junkie and was looking for some excitement. And so I, um, I wanted to go into the infantry. Uh, I wanted to, to learn how to play in the woods and, and eat bugs, and, or at least which bugs to eat if I needed to. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to jump out of airplanes, and uh, so I volunteered to as an unassigned ranger, and um, in to, in order to go through their tryouts. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the, the contingency there, if you don't make it, the army can send you worldwide at their needs. So it was a good deal for them. A lot of people didn't make it. How about you? I did, um, barely. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, basic wasn't too bad. Uh, mm -hmm. AIT wasn't wasn't that hard. It was, airborne school was uh, mostly fun, um, but there were a lot of I think kids my age that wanted to or got the unassigned ranger and through most of the you know up through AIT and airborne school most of them had decided that they wanted to do something else. That um, and for me, I, I I wanted to do it. Me and a few other people from my um, airborne class went mm -hmm. went through. Uh, we started with 128, and uh, by the f by the Monday of the fir second week, we were down to 33, and we ended up graduating about 24. Mm -hmm. And what do you recall most about the Ranger training? Well, it was mostly in the beginning was there to te to really try and see if you really wanted to do it, and. Um, it was meant to be uh, physically and mentally challenging um, and uncomfortable. It was no, it's not really, we weren't doing anything really complicated. Um, it didn't require a lot of experience, it just really, all you had to do was not quit and continue to do what was asked of you. And, um, and, and that was it, we did that for three weeks, then you get to the unit and then the unit starts all over again on you. But then there's a purpose to it. They're trying to train you to do your job, and uh, to be—it's um, the only going into the ranges is really the only way for uh, someone to come off the street to go through basic and then get into a special operations unit. All the others kind of require a lot of experience to get selected for. So you finished ranger training. Mm -hmm. We're still in 1989. Yes. Okay. Tell us what happened next. So this was airborne school in the ranger assessment program, uh, which they called RIP at the time. And uh, then I was assigned to 3rd Ranger Battalion, which was also at Fort Benning. And um, I hadn't yet gone on leave and was looking forward to that first trip home. And uh, within a couple weeks of getting there, we started to prepare for the invasion of Panama. Although I didn't know it at the time. Not too many people did. No. Uh, according to, of course, the research that the United States wanted to oust Emmanuel Noriega, mm -hmm. and the action still rises some controversy in Panama to this day. Sure. But what were you told at the time? Well, um, we we're getting into uh, a series of operations that I didn't know at the time, but you know, f through my four years there, we would do them every a couple times a year. We'd go through these uh, operations, which were more. Um, specialized and oriented around some type of world contingency, so something that was happening in the world that we were preparing for. Mm -hmm. um, and this year, we were the October coup attempt had just occurred down in um, in Panama, where Noriega was not overthrown and ended up defeating his uh, enemies, who were then executed. And uh, so, at that point, we started preparing for the invasion ourselves. And we did a number of rehearsals, uh, which took place in. in you know, around Georgia, but the final one down in um, uh, Florida, I think it was Eglin Air Force Base, mm -hmm. where we parachuted in and did an operation which was very, very similar to what the actual one tended to be. 
Were you actually in Panama City? Nope. Um, so my objective was about 70 miles uh, away from Panama City, called Rio Hato, which was a military airstrip that the, uh, the Panamanian Defense Force, they had an NCO Academy there, they had their Macho de Monte forces, which were their, their elite. Um, they're very good, well, we trained them. Uh, in fact, my father might have been involved in some of that as well. Um, and the, um, and, and the really, that was the extent, and also Noriega had a, a beach house there that, that he would go to sometimes, so there was some chance that we'd catch him there too. Because mm -hmm. uh, again, I think Noriega managed to elude for a mm. little while, yeah. but then he was eventually captured. Right, so he wasn't at the beach house. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, apparently, I don't know much about what happened outside of our operation, but uh, we apparently did, missed him by only by not that much. Wow. So, but um, they did know we were coming. So, and I don't know if you want to get into the operation. Yeah, at go this right point. ahead. So, uh, when we were notified after the rehearsal, uh, we got a few days off, and we were alerted, brought back in, and started the packing and preparation for a 16-hour deployment. Usually it takes about 16 hours for us to, to go anywhere in the world. Um, and we uh, went down to the airstrip down at Fort Benning. Uh, it was cold, it was raining. It was December in Georgia. So, um, and we loaded up the aircraft. There were, uh, I think it was 17 or 18 C-130s. And um, I was not on uh, the jump clearing team. Some would jump, some would be on the air land. And I was air land. Um, and um, on the flight down, the flight took about seven, seven or so hours. Um, they had told us that they knew we were coming, that we had been compromised, that someone up at Fort Bragg or had made a phone call, and that we didn't know the, these details at the time, but later found out that that's what happened. So they were waiting for us, and we were kind of expecting a pretty heavy resistance when we got there. But, it turns out, um, at least by the time I got on the ground, that at least the initial foothold was, was pretty strong. Mm -hmm. And Talk a little bit about the, the equipment and the uniform you were wearing at the time. Uh, for example, uh, what kind of weapons were you carrying? Mm -hmm. So um, with uniform, uh, it was the, the BDUs at the time, which was the woodland green pattern. Um, I know they went to, for a while, we went to a digital pattern. We call these the old analog version. <laughs> um, and, you know, we were, we were camouflaged up. We had an old style LCE, LVB, which really hadn't changed much since the Vietnam eras. Um, I, I was carrying an M16 at, as it, no, actually I wasn't, I was carrying a saw um, at the time. But uh, that was kind of like a temporary assignment for me, which later became permanent. But. Um, it, with our helmets, uh, because the we Panamanians, because they're allies of ours for a while, and we we also gave them a lot of their equipment, and to differentiate ourselves from them, uh, we took uh, old BDUs and shredded them up and wove them into the materials of our helmet, so that we would look distinct, um, you know, when we we're looking at each other on the ground in the dark. Because uh, we'd be hitting, you know, shortly after midnight on the 20th of December, and um, and, and that was it. I mean, that was our uniform for pretty much the 80s and most of the 90s. Getting back to when you initially landed in Panama and you were expecting heavy resistance, but you said that uh, the foothold was already pretty strong. Did you meet any resistance? Um, not really. I, I was part of, um, as, as a brand new private there in the unit, and I actually had, was not assigned to a line company yet. I was um, kind of drafted into a personnel office because uh, my test scores, um, I couldn't type, which so the joke was eventually on them. But um, so for the operation, I was part of the casualty collection team. And our job was when we got on the ground to move to a, a facility to clear it, it had already been cleared through by, uh, by the first wave, but we were to clear it a second time and then secure it and um, basically be aid and litter. So when the casualties started coming in, we would be 
the security if, if it's needed and to, to carry the um, people that need to be carried. Mm -hmm. And what was that like? Yeah, you know, I've very busy, and it, for the first night until the sun came up the next day, there wasn't much really going on, a little bit here and there. But it wasn't until everything had stopped when the casualties started coming in, and and I recall laying on my stomach before the casualties started coming in, and we had. Um, Little Birds, which were attack or AH-6 helicopters, uh, which were out of the Army inventory except for in special operations. And um, they were uh, pounding this one building where there was some resistance inside. And, um, and our perimeter was, was close to it. And so they were hitting it with some missiles and, and machine gun. And in, in one of the runs, because they would just circle around, there were two of them, and just circle around, coming back in and then the next one would come in and then they'd keep going. Um, at one point, and, and I wasn't, I, I watched it happening and when the missiles would hit, I could feel the ground hitting my chest um, on the other side of the airstrip and not really knowing what was happening in the trees, but on one of the runs, the, the rounds from the helicopter went off into the perimeter, the US perimeter and wiped out a squad and it killed, killed um, Roy Brown, uh, PFC Roy Brown, who was in ALF Company. Uh, he was, uh, hadn't yet been linked up with his unit because when you parachute in, you're all right. dispersed. Uh, and he was embedded with that squad until they could get him back. And it shot up the squad leader, Sergeant Larry Bernard, along with everybody else except for one person who was not hit in the squad. The squad is nine people. So um, I think that at that point, that's when people started to come in and it just kind of timed with other parts of the objective where they were finally getting from their casualty collection points to our central place where we had the surgeons. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then, you know, friendly enemy all started coming on all at once mm -hmm. uh, for treatment. And that's when things just got really, really busy. And, um, it's not so, I mean, I have a difficulty remembering it mm -hmm. because one, it was such a big thing to, you know, being uh, just turned 21 and never experienced anything quite like that. And it was uh, just a, a big thing to consider all at once. Um, but it was also because it was, it was just so busy. And, I, you know, I'll have flashes and, you know, I remember carrying, you know, we ended up losing four, um, four Rangers um, at that location, uh, two from 2nd Battalion and two from 3rd Battalion. And, you know, I, I was part of the team that would, you know, carry them and take their body bags and their equipment and, and help, uh, you know, put the bodies into the bags. And I have flashes of memories mm -hmm. uh, of in that, but it was just um, really busy. Yeah. I know it's never easy to lose comrades like that especially when you're on your very first engagement. Mm. So my condolences uh, oh. to your colleagues. Yep. And how long were you in this operation? So um, we were there at Rio Hato for about four days. Um, we were relieved in place by the 7th ID and, and probably the only time I came under uh, really effective fire was when the 7th ID out of Fort Ord came, were coming in behind us to relieve us and they, were, they got spooked. And, um, you know, and they, they, luckily they shot over our heads, but <laughs> uh, that was about the only time I felt where someone was actually trying to engage me, mm -hmm. and it was our own. Uh, it was a new type of doctrine, new type of warfare. Friendly fire was, was a higher risk um, during this period of time, and we hadn't yet come up with full, good technological answers for that. Mm -hmm. But um, after four days there, they relieved us. We took a helicopter ride up to uh, an American base, Howard Air Force Base, um, which was also in Panama. It's one of the remaining um, footprints there. And um, they put us up in a uh, high school uh, that had, it was empty, and we slept on the floors and in the classrooms. And that's where I found out my friend uh, Jim Markwell, who was uh, my ranger buddy in, in the assessment, the ranger assessment selection, 
he was sent to um, for, uh, First Ranger Battalion at uh, Hunter Airfield, also in Georgia, but on the other side of the state. And he was a medic, and I found out he was killed. Oh. And he was at a different he was at a different objective. He was at Tacuban Torrijos International Airport. And, um, and around that time, I also figured out that I had actually been in that school before, when I was in the sixth grade. For one day, I drove across the isthmus with my mom and got some academic testing in that school on a Saturday. So, uh, but it took me a couple of days to recognize it, and after I did, you know, it all fell into place. And I was like, wait a minute, I've been here before. This is so strange. Uh, Were you among the uh, few people who had been to Panama before? I, I can't think of anyone else that, that had been there before uh -huh. um, that I was that I was served with. Mm -hmm. And how long did Operation Just Cause uh, take place? I think it was like a couple of weeks, maybe a month. And the initial uh, forces were on the way back home within a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, I was only down there for about two weeks, and um, and we started coming back in stages. Mm -hmm. And um, so yeah, about two weeks. Yeah. And I think some of the more conventional forces were there for longer. Mm -hmm. uh, we came back, started refitting, prepared. Okay. One of the stories that comes out of that particular operation were the, was the rock and roll music being mm. played. Well, they found Noriega, and they would just kept, kept blasting rock and roll. Yeah. Uh, did you uh, hear any stories about that? No, I was nowhere near that. I mean, I know that uh, when they put us back into the school at Howard Air Force Base, we started uh, preparing for follow-on missions. Um, but si since I was in headquarters at the time and not one of the line units, I would be shortly after we got back. But they, uh, um, those were typically smaller exercises. Uh, there was a prison that they had to take down and a number of other operations and uh, the Commandancia. But um, I don't, you know, I never, I mean, once we got to Howard Air Force Base, I was pretty much stuck there and got put to work you know, in support. Uh -huh. When you did get back to the United States, uh, that was around Christmas time, wasn't it? Uh, it was the, I think the first week of January okay. or so. Mm -hmm. You know, Christmas had come, New Year's had come. Um, yeah. Okay, tell us what happened after. Well, um, we got back, and um, a couple things. We we went on block leave. Our unit would uh, we'd all take leave at once in the battalion. Uh, the way they would, we had three Ranger battalions, and one always had to be on ready for any contingency around the world. And um, so it was our turn to take leave. And so I went home for 17 days, and that was the first time I'd gone home since I joined the army. And uh, it hadn't been quite a year, but a lot had happened in that time. Um, so uh, I, I went home, came back, and then shortly after uh, requested to go to a line unit, and I was sent to Alpha Company, uh, 3rd, 3rd and 75th Ranger Regiment, where I was put into the spot that was left vacant by PFC Roy Brown, who was the saw gunner that was killed uh, down in Panama. And where were you sent to next? So I was there for uh, a number of years and promoted f up to Sergeant E5 uh, after I, I went through Ranger School and finished Ranger School, mm -hmm. which is a different animal than the Ranger uh, assessment. And, um, and promoted up. I was actually boarded for my staff sergeant. Uh, this was a, uh, so I finished my four year enlistment. Uh, there were a few other things that, that happened, but uh, nothing to that to that level. I don't know if you want me to cover any of that at all or okay. not. Well, the, uh, during your period in the army, was also wasn't that also the first Persian Gulf War? Yes, and actually, that is you know another interesting story in the mm -hmm. sense that we were as part of um, uh, we were rehearsing for a large scale um, rescue. So if you recall that Saddam Hussein had human shields. Uh, and members from the U.S. Embassy in Kuwait that were being kept. And we were training with other units around the DOD to take part in a large-scale rescue operation. 
Um, we went through the same countdown that we did prior to the invasion of Panama. We were within hours of getting on planes to go to a staging area in the Mediterranean, and when they, Hussein basically announced that uh, he was releasing the human shields at that point. And so they, they stopped the countdown, and my platoon sergeant called in his um, platoon and said, it's off for now, uh, go home, don't drink, get rest, keep your stuff packed, and be careful what you wish for. And so we went home, and the next morning we got up, nothing happened, and the day after, nothing happened. Three weeks later, um, the air war started, and then the ground war started after that, and we were still back at Fort Benning. And after preparing and training for the mission and for other missions that were um, planned in parallel, and, um, and then when everything started, we were suddenly let off the hook. Um, our, our platoon, we went to a, a hand to hand pit for the morning for PT and um, just roughed house, to, <laughs> and it's a kind way of putting it, just to kind of let the steam off because we were wound so tight for so long and for not to happen, it was like we needed a release and that was probably a smart thing to do because um, anyway. So anyway, we, we did that and then the Gulf War happened and not much else. And after I got out in 93, um, we, actually as I was getting out, we were preparing for a possibility of going into Somalia. And, um, and I got out and I, I started school at Westfield State. And when, when that attack happened on the 3rd of October, and um, you know, I knew a, a lot of people that were involved in that. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a, a strong, um, very emotional pull for me to go back. Of mo of most of my experiences in the Army, I think one of the more unpleasant ones is not being there when people you care about need you there. And I felt that I was needed and I was in the wrong place. So Ken, you left uh, the full-time Army in 93. Sure. Uh, when did you join the National Guard? Immediately. So Immediately. it was, I enlist when I, got out of one, I enlisted into the other. Mm -hmm. um, and went into a unit that was located in Agawam, Massachusetts. Um, I, I went into Westfield State College for a couple semesters. Uh, it didn't really take off for me, so I ended up working counter drug a little bit, and then I, I actually got a full-time gig working counter drug a little bit later. But, mm -hmm. um, excuse me, counter drug? Right, so there's, mm -hmm. the, the National Guard has units that are um, congressionally funded to support law enforcement. And mostly with intelligence and some, sometimes with uh, ground support and keeping police officers from getting lost in the woods, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, but that, that full time didn't come to later. Uh, I had got married around that time in, in 90, uh, 94. 94, sorry, um, and then moved up into New Hampshire and, and went back to school at UMass Lowell uh, in biology and psychology. Still in the National Guard at the time, uh, got promoted into staff sergeant, became a, uh, a squad leader, and uh, really that was, I thought, the end of my, or at least the, the anticlimax, the, um, the, you know, everything was kind of calmed down. I'd be, spend some time in the Guard, maybe retire after 20, and that would be it. Um, but I did up, end up going back to work the, for them full-time for the counter-drug program. I did that for about six years and uh, while working on my undergraduate degree. And um, during that period of time, I was uh, mobilized for Bosnia. And as we were doing our preparation for that, 9-11 uh, happened. Wow. And then the world changed again. So where were you when 9-11 took place? I was about an hour away from New York City. I was at Fort Dix, New Jersey. We were um, a couple weeks away from going over to Bosnia as part of S-410. And we had been preparing for that for some time. Uh, I was uh, a platoon sergeant, uh, an E-7 at the, at the time. 
and we weren't really sure what would happen, what was going to happen with us if we would, because they were already starting to talk about Afghanistan and the Taliban, and we were already mobilized and ready to go. Uh, we didn't think we'd be anywhere near a front line invasion, but in, in support of security operations, I think we were quite well suited for that. So, um, but we also didn't know if we'd be pulled into the city to help. And it turns out that uh, none of those things, act, well, we, went, we continued with all that turmoil and all the, those questions, but eventually they just decided to use us as they initially intended, and we were sent to Bosnia uh, for nine months. And what was Bosnia like? Uh, Eye-opening in a different way. Um, there was a lot of time to think about some really big kind of questions, uh, human nature, the nature of people in civil societies, and because and, uh, this was a country, this was Yugoslavia, um, that you know, we drove through the Sarajevo a few times, where the Olympic Park, where they had the Olympics, and and hailed uh, Yugoslavia as an example of how um, different ethnicities that had warred in the past can come together, and, and it all fell apart at some point. And some of the worst things that you could read about in, in recent in modern history occurred there. Um, so it was. Uh, is it, the mission itself was um, frustrating and a bit tedious. We were doing security and stabilization op operations, but at the same time, our force protection was ramped up so much because of what happened mm -hmm. at 9-11 and, and the fact that um, uh, where there was a fear because Bosnia was had a, a strong, especially around Mostar, had strong um, Muslim or Islam ties to Islam. And I was concerned that there would be avenues by which outsiders could come in and um, and hit us, you know, when we're not necessarily expecting it. So our force protection was ramped up, and we um, couldn't interact with the population as we would wanted to, at least not officially and, and above board. Now we did interact a lot with them, but it was just so um, impromptu and and. And we felt at that point that our, because of force protection measures, that we weren't allowed to do what we really needed to do to be, get involved with building the nation and, and understanding where the problems are and helping to solve problems. That everything had just got locked down real tight and that all of that support um, slowed down. And we were a part of that, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And what happened after Bosnia? Um, we came back, uh, there, it, most of the National Guard or the infantry units in Massachusetts were uh, deployed for homeland defense type, uh, you know, walking on the reservoirs and uh, working in airports. And we were, um, because we had just returned from overseas, we were absolved from those responsibilities, allowed to come back and recover. And, um, and because of a lot of those pressures, and I think that we lost a lot of people that, that got out because they felt they were being put to work on all this busy work without really, they felt kind of left out of what was important. And mm -hmm. at that point, things were spinning up quite, you know, quite heavily over in Afghanistan and then uh, starting also in Iraq. So, um, our numbers really hurt, got hurt uh, in terms of uh, people in uniform. A lot of people actually got out to go into the active. Um, so that would have been 2002 to 2006. And while that was going on, I, I, I finished up my undergraduate degree in, uh, at UMass Lowell in biology and psychology and um, started working here at Benedic Labs as an admin, you know, just to kind of get my foot in the door. And there was an opportunity to compete for a scholarship, a fellowship, to go back for my PhD. And, um, but before that, we actually um, 
after I got hired here at Natick, uh, we, we were activated again, almost activated for a mission in Iraq, and that one was called off almost like the last minute before they started pulling us in for a month-long ramp-up. And then they start preparing us for uh, Kosovo, which uh, would happen in 2006. Okay. So you're going back to Kosovo. Hmm. And how long was that mission? We were gone um, a year and a half. Wow. Was that the same mission as the uh, previous trip to Bosnia? It was similar. Similar. I think that um, we were permitted to kind of ramp down a little bit because right after 9-11, everything was really tight and almost paranoid, whereas by 2006, things had, um, we felt we knew what was going on enough in Kosovo that we could lighten our footprint a little, or at least our posture a little bit so that we could interact more um, productively with the populations. Mm -hmm. Had the situation in Kosovo changed um, over the years by the time you were there? Uh, was, it, was there still strife or everything's just kind of still on guard? Most of, whereas, you know, with the difference between Bosnia and Kosovo is that Bosnia, our job was there to keep the peace between the Serbian populations and the Bosnian uh, Muslims. And, um, and in that sense, we were peacekeepers. Whereas in, in Kosovo, we were more or less providing infrastructure and uh, security support. And that in a way that we were an augmentation to the police force. And we, and instead of getting on the roads in our armor and riding around like we did in Bosnia, um, we actually ran operations, including um, we did a, a raid on a, um, a, a hotel that was involved in human trafficking or at least um, prostitution. And uh, there were reports of some bad things happening there. So we, we raided, but they get raided a lot. They were were prepared for us. Um, there was cross, there were, uh, we shut down the border between Kosovo and Macedonia for a few days in a counter smuggling operation where we went off in the woods. And uh, it, that was kind of fun because as an infantry unit, you want to kind of get out there and do what we trained to do. And um, that gave us an opportunity to, to do that, mm -hmm. to get away from the vehicles a little bit. Right. So you were in Kosovo for a year and a half, and did you have a chance to contact your family? Mm -hmm. And were you doing it by email or regular mail? Right. So the evolution of that, um, in, in Bosnia, um, I could get email like twice a week or so, um, maybe a little bit more, um, but the phone calls, actually the phone calls were twice a week and they could only last like 10, 10 minutes or so. Uh, by the time we got to Kosovo, uh, we had internet in the rooms and uh, Skype. It was very poor bandwidth, and, but it, you could get through occasionally mm -hmm. and you could have a lot more conversations. Uh, we did get to go home. I, did, uh, I was in Bosnia in 2001 in December. I got to go home for a few days for the birth of my son Oh. And in Kosovo in 2006, um, I was a company first sergeant at the time, and so I was among the last to go. That's kind of a thing you do. Uh, so it was toward the end of the year and a half, and I, I met my, I went and visited my family, and we went to um, Florida, Disney World. Um, and then and then went back. So I mean, traditionally, I mean, we could get uh, also also in Kosovo. Um, my wife flew over. Uh, my wife at the time flew over to um, uh, Sofia, Bulgaria, mm -hmm. and um, I, I met her there for a weekend. We had a, a weekend pass, and we all, we had a, everybody got their chance to go go to Bulgaria. So. And so, there were, yeah, there were a few occasions to get away from work. But, oh, that's good. Yeah. At the end of 18 months, what happened? 
Well, um, really, and this happened too after Bosnia, but really not that eight year and a half coming back home and uh, that hangover, we call it the, the deplo deployment hangover when you get back. And for a year plus, you're, you're working every day. It can be very stressful. You don't really have a time. There's not a day that goes by where you can just completely disengage. I mean, even on days where you're not really working, on days off, Thing, you, you have to be, you have to react to all kinds of things and, and make decisions. Um, and in, uh, being in charge of 100 soldiers, it was always something going on. So when I got home and had no responsibilities for like the first four to six weeks, I couldn't make a decision to save my life. You know, I'd get a call, you know, could you pick up any milk? And it's like, ah, oh, it's too much for me. <laughs> um, but after about four to six weeks, everything started to equi equilibrate and I you know, we started drilling again and, and recovering from the deployment and getting ready for whatever the next thing is, is, is going to happen. Um, I left the, the company, the infantry company, um, a, f a year or so. This would have been, so in 2009, 2008, I had applied for that scholarship to go back for my PhD. And um, anticipating that, I moved to a unit in Wellesley to take over the, the first sergeant job there, um, which was a, uh, a rear detachment type unit. Uh, it was a, it was a uh, headquarters section. And um, very low um, level of responsibility when you compare it to an infantry unit. And the intent there was to ride out by 20, because I had another year to go to retire and I'd be in graduate's program at that point and putting my effort into that. But uh, after I was there for a couple months, um, the 182 infantry out of um, uh, Melrose uh, was being sent to Afghanistan and they needed uh, an operations sergeant major. And <laughs> they offered the promotion to me. I was, I was the top guy on the list and um, and I talked it over with my, my wife and we decided that, well, we'll just do it one more time. We seemed, you know, with the year and a half in Kosovo that we'd kind of cracked the code on it and knew how to handle the deployments okay. Um, so we started preparing for that in 2008, 2009. I went to school uh, at Brandeis in 2009. I started school there and um, really underestimated the amount of work that I'd have to do in, in the graduate program there. So for the first year and a half that I was there before going to Afghanistan, I was, I was a consummate student. And I just completely put myself into, into my schoolwork. Uh, in a way, there was a little bit of panic there because I felt that you know, I was very close to, to falling off the cliff. Mm -hmm. you know, whether it was or not, I, I can't, I don't know. I survived. Um, and you know, we had some floods, I think if you remember, Back, oh, very was, well, 2010. Yep, yep, we got called out for that, and mm -hmm. it was actually spring break. So uh, I got back, all the kids are coming in from Florida or whatever, <laughs> you know, their mm -hmm. tans, and I'm coming off uh, my spending a week in, in the Melrose Armory coordinating the relief efforts or helping in the coordination. And, um, and then, um, you know, toward the end of 2010, we started to, to ramp up and activate. Um, in March of 2011 is when I went back on active, and I left mid-semester at a school at Brandeis there. And, um, and we and it went initially to Camp Atterbury, which was my second time there. I had been there before with the Kosovo deployment, uh, is, is, a, is our bulb station, and, um, and then to Afghanistan. Okay. And what part of Afghanistan uh, did you land? So, did we land? I don't, on the way in, I don't think we went into Kandahar. I think we, we flew from an, a, mil, a charter aircraft from, I wanna say, I don't think we went through Kuwait either. On the way in, I think we flew out of Germany, believe it or not, um, into Afghanistan. But I can't recall exactly, and we flew directly into, um, in the Kabul area. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were to be split up. And of course, 
our, our, our battalion was, you know, or the, the actual platoons within the infantry companies were part of the security forces for different provincial reconstruction teams around the, the country. Mm -hmm. And our headquarters section and operations were put there in uh, Camp Phoenix in Kabul as part of the, um, the base defense plan there. And we also extended some responsibilities out to managing the platoons that were out at the PRTs. Mm -hmm. So, but we went into Kabul and uh, I, I stayed at Camp Phoenix and the rest of the battalion, much of it got split out all over the place. And what were your duties there? Um, my job uh, was in, in current operations or, or you know, the day-to-day -day was to run the base defense. Uh, I was involved in uh, uh, reorganization of the defense. Um, the plan that was in place that we fell on didn't meet our, wasn't satisfactory to us, so we rewrote and, and did that. And I, was, I spent a lot of time doing that and then making sure that the perimeter was sound and if, any, if there are any issues that arise that needed um, our attention, that, that I was really the person that, that would be involved in that. Mm -hmm. There are a few other people too. We had our base, uh, the BDOC, uh, the operations center, the base defense operations mm -hmm. center, which would handle the steady state stuff. Okay. Was the camp ever under attack while you were there? No, I and mean, there were shots here and there that mm -hmm. would get thrown, but um, I know the rotation before us that was also out of Massachusetts, their front gate got attacked, and um, so I spent a lot of time in the morning um, after morning prayers, so between 4 and 5 a.m. out there um, just in case mm -hmm. you know, something would happen. But, but no, it was actually fairly quiet. Um, it was a pretty uneventful rotation for the most part. Mm -hmm. Now, Ken, describe um, the uniform and the equipment that you were being issued now as opposed to maybe 20 years ago. Sure. Um, well, when we went into Panama, we didn't have body armor. Um, we did pack it in a duffel bag, but we didn't, never wore it. Uh, the, we did wear body armor in, in Kosovo uh, and, and Bosnia. But not like Afghanistan with the new systems that, that we got that had plates on the sides and um, different flaps and things, Kevlar covering more. So it was heavier, larger, bulkier. Our, um, our equipment was bulkier and heavier. We could carry more, but at the same time, you know, it, it, uh, you felt less natural moving around in it than, say, this, the equipment that I wore in 1989. What about the issue of IEDs? Um, well, that was an issue, and in fact, um, that killed a good, good, actually, that's something I probably could have mentioned earlier, but, um, you know, going and riding around, we had these armored buses for traveling between the different bases in the Kabul cluster, and uh, I'd been on a couple of them, bouncing around when the, we had some Apollo astronauts as part of the USO tour uh, visit us and because I was the biggest nerd anyone knew, uh, they, you know, I got, got put on that detail, um, got to run it. And um, so, you know, driving and fly, driving with these guys around Kabul, it's, uh, there were very busy streets, very congested and anxiety provoking, but generally, generally safe until they're not. And we had an incident where one of those armored buses was hit with a uh, vehicle-borne IED um, that included, um, uh, let's say, a half a dozen people from Camp Phoenix, where we were at, a couple of them I knew, not real well, but, uh, and, and people from other different camps killed everybody on board except for the driver and, and threw the bus. I mean, just, wow. it was a uh, large, um, IED or B bed, and um, so, and that was uh, Colonel Castro. No, okay, yeah, I'm not trying. It's I, okay. Every, every, I try to remember the names like every every Memorial Day yeah. and write them down. Um, there's about 23 names so far. Mm -hmm. um, I'll remember it in a few minutes. That's okay. 
So how long were you stationed in Kabul, in Camp Phoenix? So we got mobilized in March. I think it was in May or so when we started moving over there. I was there until um, I think the first week of December, mm -hmm. and then I started moving out to um, through Kandahar and up through Kyrgyzstan and then, then home. I got home around the 15th of, of, of uh, December. And what year? That was 2011. Okay. Ooh, so you've been, you're back home now. And tell us what happened after. Um, well, uh, during August or s uh, September, actually, um, of 2011, my marriage started falling apart mm -hmm. while I was overseas. And, um, you know, I think we did, I, I got to go home in, toward the end of September for about 11 days and then I had to go back over to Afghanistan and, and we were trying to do what we could over Skype and trying to figure out a way through this and make various promises and one of which was I needed to lighten my load. You know, I was certainly putting a lot of time in the school. The Army was taking up a lot of my time. The deployments away were, um, you know, large drains. So I, I put in my papers uh, to retire. Not Well, I told them I would retire and, I, and, and put in the papers when I got home. Uh, but it'd take a few more months to, to work that through. Um, but by the, before I even came home from Afghanistan, the, the goal was for me to retire. Um, when I did finally get home, we, um, we ended up separating pretty quickly. We, I, we waited until after the holidays before we started telling family, and, and by the 7th of January, I was uh, living out. I was mm -hmm. on my own. And we had uh, filed for separation at that point. Eventually, we were divorced. Mm -hmm. So that was happening, and um, I also started to get back to school and finishing up the semester that I had left in the middle of. And, um, and getting ready to sell the house and, and everything else. So there was a lot going on. It was a tough few years that followed, I think. Um, not just the divorce, but getting into the, the dissertation for the PhD, which ironically was about stress. And um, and and I think one of the things that I think we underestimate is how much we put into our various roles um, and how they kind of define us and give us momentum. Mm -hmm. And I found that like all of a sudden I was uh, no longer a husband. I was hardly a father because uh, I had been from school before I deployed and then I was gone for a year. And then now I was retiring, I was no longer a soldier. And um, you know, the transition, it was a big transitional period for me. Mm -hmm. So you now retired from the Army National Guard and you're still working at the labs. Hmm. Did, have you ever uh, taken advantage of some of the programs offered uh, through Mass Department of Veterans? No. No? Uh, I've, um, I've interacted with the VA a little mm -hmm. bit, and that's, right, that's pretty much it. Okay. And what kind of medals and, or accommodations did you earn? Um, well, going back, you know, the, um, in Panama, uh, or my first enlistment, I, I got the combat infantryman's badge. Mm -hmm. um, I went through, I earned the expert infantryman's badge. I got an AAM Army Achievement Medal and an Army Accommodation Medal at the end of my to uh, service. Uh, Armed Forces Expeditionary Medal with Arrowhead Device for the invasion of Panama. Um, I earned the Ranger Tab and the Parachutist Badge as well as the, the Belgium Parachutist Badge. I earned uh, a, num a couple other Army Achievement Medals and in in ARCOM's Army Commendation Medals as well. Uh, three Meritorious Service Medals um, for, for as I moved up the ranks, 
levels of service as a platoon sergeant and a first sergeant, and also in counter drug. And uh, my last tour, um, Bronze Star Medal. And when you retired from the Army, what was your rank? I retired, when I retired, I was a sergeant major. Okay. Uh, but I hadn't completed the sergeant major course. I needed to go f to uh, Fort Bliss for three weeks in order to finish that. I opted instead to retire. So after I got out, I was administratively reduced back down to master sergeant. Okay. And did you join any uh, veterans groups like the Legion? Actually, uh, yes and no. I, I was always, like when I got back from Panama, my dad enrolled me into the VFW and paid my, um, my annual rate and I never really, I never went. I, I, I probably used their resources a little bit mm -hmm. when I got out in 93 uh, in, in working with the VA, but um, I, my father let it go and, and I, I never paid much attention to it. But after my Kosovo deployment and again after Afghanistan, uh, the town I was living in, in Wilton, New Hampshire, asked me to come and talk on Memorial Day. And the people that organized that were from the American Legion. So I, I, ca I came and I gave the talk um, after Kosovo and, and shortly after I got a, a membership card from the American Legion in the mail. And I figured, you know, they, they gave me a, uh, paid my, gave me a year and that was it. Mm -hmm. But then a year later I got another one and it kept happening. <laughs> Then I got back from Afghanistan and gave another um, speech to the town, um, and uh, there was this was I had separated, had moved out, and I uh, kept getting these cards, and um, it never really I sent them never sent them any money. I never asked or filled out any forms. They just found out, and gave my name, and and keep keep paying my. My, uh, my rate so that I keep getting membership cards and I still get them. Um, and like I said, there were some hard years where I felt very disenfranchised and, and uh, alone and then I'd get this letter, this handwritten address in the mail, the American Legion in Wilton, New Hampshire, and here's my card again for this year. And uh, you know, it's, um, Uh, anyway, uh, as we wrap up this interview, Ken, uh, how important has it been for you to serve in the military? Um, well, it's kind of a family business, but I can't imagine it being any other way for me. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, I, I, I did it for a long time and um, it was a big part of my identity, and, and, and now as a scientist working for the labs here, um, it's it's my it's my people, it's my it's my culture. It's I'm a you know I can't say I've been a fan of everything that we've done as a country, uh, and a fan of every war that we've gone to, but. The people that that serve and you know and do what their nation asks of them, mm -hmm. I, I have a lot of affinity toward that. So even now that I'm out and a civilian, I I um, you know want to do what I can and, and, uh, and see what I could do to repay back like, a lot of the okay. the great things that I've received. Well, Kenneth Pitts, we thank you so much for coming and taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project.